New Thinking Allowed, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the mind-body problem. With me is Dr. Stafford Betty, a philosopher and professor of religious studies at California State University in Bakersfield. Dr. Betty is author of Vadi Raja's Refutation of Shankara's Non-Dualism, as well as a novel, The Imprisoned Splendor, and The Afterlife Unveiled, and Heaven and Hell Unveiled. Welcome, Stafford. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. When we think of the mind-body problem, it seems as if it's it's a conundrum that's been around for a couple of thousand years, yep. and uh, philosophers, af- after generations and generations of debate and exploration, don't seem to have arrived at uh, a- anything near agreement as as to how to resolve this problem. Can, can you explain for our viewers why it's a problem in the first place? Right. <clears throat> Most of the uh, people who've lived on this planet have been, they don't know this and they would not use this terminology to define themselves, but they are mind-body dualists. Mm-hmm. That is to say, they believe that they are bodies and the brain is part of the body. Um, that's one part of us, but there's another part of us, and that's the soul. And the soul is immaterial, very different from the body and the brain. Mm-hmm. So how do these two parts of us relate to each other? Yeah. How does one get any purchase on the other? How does the soul mm-hmm. interact why, with Why do you the brain? say the soul is immaterial? Because that is what all of the <laughs> traditions have told us down uh-huh. through the ages, Christianity, Hinduism, etc. It's thought to be uh, uh, a, a substance, it is sometimes called an immaterial substance, mm-hmm. which uh, has no dimensions, doesn't weigh anything, mm-hmm. there's no volume, there's no color, there's no shape, mm-hmm. but it's real. Mm-hmm. And many mind-body dualists would say it's the most real part about us. It, it meaning, is our consciousness. Meaning our center of awareness. It is. It mm-hmm. is our conscious self. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you think about it, our thoughts, our feelings, they don't have any dimension. They don't have any color. They have no volume. So the question is, how in the world uh, does this part of us react to and interact with the physical brain? Mm-hmm. I mean, it does seem as if there's a location. I'm yeah. inside of my body most right. of the time. I'm not inside of your body, typically. Yeah, that is that is certainly correct. Mm-hmm. So, yes, the assumption is that uh, the soul is either... Either it suffuses the entire body, or it is, somebody said it is at the pineal gland. That's where its mm-hmm. location is. The pineal gland right yeah, there in the right. center of the exactly. forehead. Exactly. But, yeah. but, you know, we really ha- don't have any idea where it would be. Yeah. All we know is if we are a dualist, mm-hmm. if that is our philosophy, all we know is that it is our essential self, and it is somehow connected with the body and interacts with it constantly and uh, very felicitously. Mm-hmm. And, and it would seem... I, I suppose uh, that there's nothing in physics, nothing in the science of mm-hmm. uh, matter mm-hmm. and energy to suggest that consciousness should exist. That's right. <laughs> there isn't. Um, how did consciousness just jump into existence? Most philosophers, virtually all physicists, think, think that there was no such thing at the Big Bang. And there was no such thing probably a billion years down the road. Mm -hmm. Somehow it emerged. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the great mysteries um, that science and uh, philosophy is trying to solve as well. Mm -hmm. When did it emerge? How did it emerge? And does it really make any sense to say that it emerged? So there are all kinds of debates going on about this. Mm Mm-hmm. When we think of these debates, Mm -hmm. uh, you've got on the one hand the scientific camp that says that consciousness, I think technically they tend to call it an epiphenomenon. That is. Okay. That's one of the words. An emergent phenomenon from, from matter itself. That when the brain get, reaches a certain level of complexity, consciousness just occurs. It does. Often uh, people might Mm -hmm. say because of feedback loops in the brain or some such thing. Uh, 
Now, religious traditions ha have a different story completely. Totally different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> how, and how do they typically view consciousness? Religious traditions, mm -hmm. um, as there to begin with, um, take Catholicism, for mm -hmm. example. Um, consciousness is part of who we are from the moment of conception. Uh, it doesn't emerge out of the brain. The brain's not even there yet. But there is the physical substance and there is the uh, the spiritual substance or mm -hmm. the soul. They go together and they're created at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, one doesn't emerge out of the other. So this whole idea of, e of emergentism is not uh, what you find typically in the uh, religious traditions of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, in philosophy, the dualist position is often associated with Rene Descartes. Is, that is, is it correct. Not? That's right. And uh, we talk about Cartesian coordinates. Right. right. For, for example, dividing the whole world up into to mind and body. I did an interview not long ago in, with another philosopher, Jason Giorgiani, and he okay. suggested that mm -hmm. Descartes was actually an agent of the Catholic Church, and he developed his philosophy in order to sort of demarcate that the Church had authority mm -hmm. over the mind, over the soul, and that it was not to be considered part of the domain of science. Right. You know, uh, Descartes would, of course, deny that. Yeah. Uh, but I think that makes good sense mm -hmm. because he does take some leaps that are very difficult to imagine uh, as being uncolored by his fidelity to Catholicism. I mean, mm -hmm. he was a Frenchman, a 17th yeah. century Frenchman, and he knew what Catholicism stood for. And it's easy to assume that he did lean in that direction. And perhaps his philosophy, his dualism, his Cartesian dualism was influenced by that, that bias. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with, with him mm -hmm. there. Though again, Descartes would, would deny that. He mm -hmm. thought he was starting completely fresh and uh, had no biases whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Tabula rasa. That's uh -huh. how he started. A blank slate. Blank slate. Yeah. And he, he, he would swear that that's, mm -hmm. that's what he started with and that uh, he was biased in no direction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But I suspect he may have been. Yeah. Now, you started off by suggesting that most people are sort of native dualists. Yeah. That, 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 that's sort of a, I guess you could call it a folk philosophy, <laughs> mind and body. Right. Are, are, but many people, I think, like to think of themselves as uh, monists. Everything is unified. Right. That right. maybe maybe matter isn't what we think it is, especially these days in the era of uh, all of the paradoxes of quantum physics. Right. Matter seems quite right. mysterious, actually. Right. And perhaps... Uh, Underlying it all uh, is is a single. Uh, in fact, maybe even consciousness itself is is the underlying foundation of all reality. Yeah, is the primordial uh, is the primordial reality. That's being discussed more and more just in the last ten or fifteen years. Mm -hmm. There are scientists, not scientists so much, but philosophers and psychical researchers and other peculiar types mm -hmm. who who are inclined to think that if anything. Uh, the physical emerged out of the out of consciousness, mm -hmm. rather than that consciousness emerged out of the physical after a certain number of billions of years. I mean, when, when the uh, religious scriptures say God created the universe, right. that implies God being a, a conscious entity That's right. existed prior to the physical universe and and it was the source of it. That's exactly right. So mm -hmm. that uh, that that point of view that's becoming slightly more fashionable just in the in recent years mm -hmm. really harkens back to you might even say back to Genesis mm -hmm. to the very beginning that God started it all and of course God is consciousness mm -hmm. yeah now, I guess scientists typically but not always right. have a problem with that point they have a great problem with that that's yeah. right and one of the reasons they do is they work with physical stuff all the time and they become, you might say, fixated on that physical stuff. I think there's the word cathexis. Yeah. You become uh, uh, determinedly committed to a particular worldview. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you find probably a majority of physicists and a majority of scientists who really don't have any patience with this talk of soul. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if there's no soul, there's no spirit, there's no God. There is no afterlife, and all we are is this physical 
this marvelously mm-hmm. physical yeah. thing that we call human being, but we don't last very long. Some of us mm-hmm. last maybe a day or two. Others are fortunate enough to go to 95. But um, as you can see, there's a tremendous difference in the way we look at ourselves, if you have that point of view, from the way we look at ourselves, if we think of ourselves as an immortal soul with a destiny. Mm -hmm. There's a huge divide here, and this is an important question. And it all goes back to the way we think of the mind and the body. Mm -hmm. The the mind-body problem is linked to these great metaphysical questions, which are more than metaphysical questions. They are existential questions. Mm -hmm. Um, One could make the case that uh, if you look upon uh, our destiny as becoming nothingness at the point of death, that creates a kind of gloom about <laughs> about one's, about the way we think of human destiny. Mm-hmm. Most of us don't like to think about death, especially if we have that point of view. Um, but if we think that, you know, death is just the beginning of a new chapter, um, that gives a kind of buoyancy to life here and mm-hmm. now. It tells us, hey, what we're doing here uh, may be important. Uh, it may carry over into our experience in the next world. Mm-hmm. At least... It affirms that there is a next world and that we don't become nothing. In, in other words, what you're, you're saying is that if you're a materialistic monist, right. if That's you believe that it. matter is the basis of everything real, That's right. then, then there's no possibility in, in your view of uh, an afterlife. Um, I think that that would have to follow mm-hmm. because obviously um, the brain ceases to exist and if And remember that a materialist believes that all of our thoughts, all of our feelings emanate Mm -hmm. from the brain, Mm -hmm. from electrochemical events in the brain. And when that stops, we stop. And that's the end of us. Mm -hmm. Lights out. Lights out. That's right. (laughs) And it's all over. However, if you're a dualist, Uh then the possibility exists uh, of of a world that is pure consciousness or pure spirit. Right. Spiritual realms of of all sorts. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge question. Now, you also uh, write about uh, another alternative. I think you call it transcendental materialism. Right. I do. This is... um, uh, a point of view that um, <clears throat> it's not unique to me by any means. It goes back to the ancient Stoic philosophers, um, Cleanthes, Chrysippus, and the founder Zeno. Mm-hmm. And all the all three of these believed that there was a logos, closest thing that we they could think of to a god, the a creator, logos. a logos, L O G O S. The in, in other words, it goes back to the old Greek biblical saying, in the beginning was the Word, and exactly the Word so. was God. Yeah, right out and, of John's Gospel. And Logos referred to the Word. At That's that exactly point, right. The, the right. voice of God, so to speak. Right. That is correct. So um, <clears throat> these are individuals who believed very much in an afterlife. They believed in this Logos. Uh, they believed deeply in souls, but... They also thought that souls and even the Logos itself was in some super ethereal sense material. Mm-hmm. Okay, transcendentally material. Okay, so we're talking about gradations of spirit, gradations of matter, the most lofty gradation being what we would call spirit. Mm-hmm. But in their view, even what we call spirit has some degree of materiality. Okay. Not enough to make or to rule out um, an afterlife. No, not at all, because that level of materiality is not the kind of matter that ceases to exist at death. It's not, it doesn't have mm-hmm. that capacity to cease yeah. to exist. So, what's good about this um, ancient Stoic philosophy and why I'm attracted to it is that <clears throat> um, All of reality is of a piece. Mm -hmm. So that initial problem, remember how I started talking about how it's difficult to imagine how the soul has any purchase on the body? Mm -hmm. Something immaterial, utterly immaterial, having any ability to interact with and control? Two different substances. Totally different substances. How can they interact at all if they're so different? Exactly Mm -hmm. so. Now we have one substance Mm -hmm. with enormous levels of gradation. Mm -hmm. Of subtlety. Of subtlety. Going from the lowest Mm -hmm. um, lump of coal to the most ethereal sort of reality that we would uh, associate with the Logos or with Mm -hmm. the soul. 
So now you don't have this, this, <clears throat> this, uh, this abyss that we have to cover between the pure immaterial and the purely material. Mm -hmm. We have simply levels of materiality, and that makes it easier to account for the the um, interaction between the two parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, and Stafford, you are a Sanskrit scholar, yeah. and uh, in addition to citing the ancient Greek Stoics, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the uh, uh, Hindu philosophy of Vedanta and, and, and all of the ancient Sanskrit literature is quite right. similar in this regard, Absolutely. is it not? It is indeed, and um, the uh, there, there are many schools of Vedanta. The mm -hmm. one that's most uh, well known in the West is what we call Advaita Vedanta yes. or non dualist Vedanta. Mm -hmm. And they believe that the only ultimate reality is what they call something totally immaterial, Brahman. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brahman uh, is without even features. It doesn't have any attributes. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can say about Brahman is Satchitananda, mm -hmm. an infinite reality bliss and consciousness. Yes. And that's all you can say about reality. And ultimately, everything that has come down from Brahman is, from their point of view, somewhat illusory. Mm -hmm. The only ultimate reality is pure consciousness. Everything else is... Uh, is Maya. Maya, the great it's, goddess of illusion. Right. It's You know, it has a kind of semi-reality. It has a conventional reality. But ultimately, it's not even real. Mm -hmm. The only reality being this purely immaterial... But, uh, but, uh, but there are also levels, are there not? Gradations of matter. Uh, not for the Advaita Vedanta. Okay. There is just... <laughs> pure Brahman. There's pure Brahman. And everything else... Let me back up a minute. Yeah. Um, I think I know what you're getting at mm -hmm. now. I didn't catch that. Yeah, there are levels mm -hmm. of materiality. For example, what they call the mind... Uh, is material in mm -hmm. their view, but it's subtly material. Mm -hmm. The body obviously is grossly material. Mm -hmm. So they would make distinctions between one grade and another. I, but all of these gradations are of rel relatively little importance compared to the only ultimate reality, mm -hmm. which is purely immaterial. Well, you use the phrase in, in some of your writing, sheaths. And yeah. I believe sheaths. that it comes from the Sanskrit literature. It does indeed. That's and right. the idea is, is a sh sword is held in a sheath. Right, right. So there are these different bodies, each inside the other. That's right. That is correct. <laughs> uh, and you find this um, in all of the schools of Vedanta that I have um, that I've run into. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it's an interesting concept, and it's one that I have a, a, a lot of uh, uh, appeal uh, that I find appealing, mm -hmm. namely that um, uh, within the physical body. There is uh, an immaterial, or let's put it this way, a subtle body, mm -hmm. um, an ethereal body. Mm -hmm. It's still material, but it is not grossly material. Now, you use the term ethereal, right. and, and I understand mm -hmm. that that's a right. term that was popularized largely in the 19th century at a, at a time when that's right. physical scientists right. believed in a substance called right. the ether. Right. Which was a subtle substance that right. subsequently been discarded. Scientists right. no longer believe in the ether, but right. in the spiritual right. literature, mm -hmm. the, the term is is still used. And Absolutely. So, so we have a problem, which mm -hmm. is is that mm -hmm. while the philosophy of, as you call it, transcendental materialism, right. these various subtle bodies, each right. within the other, and sheaths, and yes. the astral body, the etheric body, right. and, and and so on, make a lot of sense mm -hmm. on the one hand. On the other hand, a scientist is quick to point out, well, there's no physical evidence for these subtle bodies. Right. Well, that's another story. Yeah. Uh, I think there's an enormous amount of uh, evidence uh, uh -huh. for these bodies. Yes. Um, but it's it's a rich subject, and it really uh, takes us into the study of psychical research. Mm -hmm. That's where we get the best hints of these of these realities. Yes. But to get back to uh, Hindu Hindu belief, there has never been any doubt about these bodies from as early as the Upanishads, as mm -hmm. far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And so when we die, it's their belief. Yeah, we shed the physical body as a as a snake sheds its 
its old, worn-out body, and what it, what emerges is a new, fresh body. Mm -hmm. And it's the body that we will have when we go into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. It becomes the outer body at death, in other words. Mm -hmm. And uh, underneath that particular sheath is an even subtler sheath, which I don't want to get into. It's... Um, some, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the Hindu scriptures speak of five sheaths. Mm -hmm. The, uh, outermost being the sheath that we call the physical body. But there are these other subtler. And, and I gather that each sheath is associated with a, a different level of consciousness. That's exactly right. A level of spiritual awareness, That's perhaps. Right. There, that is exactly right. And with, uh, and with a different world. Mm -hmm. Um, um, there is the causal world which is a subtle, a subtler world than the astral world, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so, you know, Hinduism and Buddhism uh, are, are very attached to this notion of, of sheath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so, and again, this, this takes us back, I think, towards uh, the notion of transcendental materialism and back to those ancient Stoics mm -hmm. who were attracted to the various levels, uh, the various gradations of materiality. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's an ancient philosophy. The, the Stoics, of course, are highly respected philosophers. Mm -hmm. But how does uh, how do modern philosophers deal with that point of view? Okay, let, let me let me first of all uh, first of all they they um, I, I think I read somewhere that seventy seven percent of academic philosophers teaching in uh, our colleges in the United States are atheists. Mm. And I suspect that uh, as many of them are materialists as well. They all have nothing to do with any of what I've been talking about. Okay. All right. But they have a big problem. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, they don't know how to account for the emergence of consciousness out of a physical brain. Right. What they're saying, in effect, is that meat thinks. Mm -hmm. Meat has deep Powerful emotions. Mm -hmm. Meat can love, can hate, can doubt, can do all of the things that we do with our mind. Yeah. And what is the what is the thing that's doing all of this? It's the brain, and the brain is made out of meat. Okay, they have no clue. No one has any clue, and they would admit it. They don't know how all of this activity in this physical brain, this physical activity, can result in all of this extraordinarily mm -hmm. <laughs> personal and immaterial seeming conscious uh, awarenesses mm -hmm. that we have. So that's their great problem. They have yeah. much to account for, and they haven't succeeded. Right. On the other hand, the problem that the dualist has to face is, again, how do these things interact with each other mm -hmm. if they are so different from each other? Mm -hmm. Transcendental materialism is an effort to bridge that gap between those two schools. And, and my understanding is if one delves into the Sanskrit literature in right. particular, yeah. they have very detailed descriptions of how these interactions uh, could possibly occur. They do. <laughs> they have a whole vocabulary that would mean nothing to any casual uh, uh, reader of a translation. You're quite right. Well, more and more people are learning about this vocabulary. The chakras, for yeah. instance, it right. used to be a very esoteric term. Right. And now I find that a high percentage of, I imagine uh, many of our viewers will know right away when I use a term, the chakras, they'll, right. they have a sense of what that is. Right. Or, or organs of spiritual perception. Yeah. Organs, that's a great way to put it. Or instruments of mm -hmm. spiritual perception. Um, and you're quite right. Um, uh, I think that most people who do that kind of meditation, who meditate on chakras, are very at home with the kind of metaphysics that, um, that I stand for, whether or not it's clean-cut mind-body dualism or this kind of transcendental um, compromise that I've mm -hmm. come up with. They tend to believe in afterlife. They mm -hmm. tend to believe in spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. The great majority of them do, unlike the majority of scientists who are still stuck, mm -hmm. as I would say, in their materialism. But when you refer to transcendental materialism, right. you're, you're suggesting at least the possibility that one could remain a materialist yes. and still have an appreciation for paranormal phenomena, uh, and the existence of an afterlife, yes. uh, uh, everything associated with... Absolutely. That's what I'm, I'm reaching out to the materialist community uh, and, and just asking them to consider whether or not they 
are just wasting their time in debunking one more time classical mind-body dualism. Let's yeah. do something different. Let's mm -hmm. see if we can't find a compromise. And I think that uh, what I have found is a compromise. By the way, uh, Carl Jung is a person who also shares this view. The, the great Swiss psychiatrist. The great Swiss psychiatrist is also convinced that all reality is of one piece. Mm -hmm. And obviously, he had a very advanced near-death experience near the end of his life and was a deep believer in spiritual reality and mm -hmm. afterlife and so forth. Um, so for him to come on board, mm -hmm. actually, I'm coming on board with him. <laughs> well, if, if we wanted to make a list of great scientists who have embraced this point of view, mm -hmm. uh, Carl Jung would be one, but we probably could include uh, many others. Many other Nobel yeah. laureates, even. Yes, that is that is true. Mm -hmm. um, there have been quite a few. Um, many of them, uh, you know, uh, many of them were were uh, attracted to psychical research, yeah. and uh, their names would probably be um, unknown to most current mm -hmm. philosophers. But quite a few of them were were uh, Nobel laureates in yeah. their own day. Some of the real greats. Mm -hmm. Well, Stafford, Betty, what a pleasure to have this conversation <laughs> with you. It's been a delight. It, it's been a delight and it's been enlightening. Thank you so much for being with me. Thanks, Jeff. I am honored to be with you. And thank you for being with us.